into a little more detail, but um, I, from what I'm seeing, it, I'm a firm believer the more you give away, in fact, Anita is a perfect example of this. She gives everything away on her site. Maybe she gives away too much. So there is a balance, but um, she does give away everything, but she's a true authority. She comes, she is asked to come speak at conferences. And if she had a, donations. And if she wait, <laughs> if Anita had a book, she would be selling her book at her conferences. So the fact of giving the content away for free is very important because how are people ever going to know who you are and what you know unless you give it away? I don't think that you have a place to ask for money for what you know until you've already proved to people that you know more than they need to know. Seth Godin gave away tons of ebooks early in his career. You know, he's authored 100 books. But a tons of them are these very short ebooks that he gives away for free. It wasn't until, you know, he had been doing this for years before he started to get these books like All Markers Are Liars or Purple Cow that he started to sell lots of books. So from if you are a speaker, and Seth Godin is a speaker, give it away because you're gonna get speaking, you're gonna get known um, by, based on what you give away. So we're gonna get into some nuts and bolts of the publishing. So Ebook distribution. Now, there's two key distinctions you need to understand about the ebook ebook distribution model. There's the direct model and there's the indirect model, which is aggregators. These guys really bother me, and I'll tell you why. They're the ones who say, "We'll publish your ebook for you. We'll take care of it. We'll get it to all the distribution points for you. But you know what? We'll pay you, and we're going to take 50 percent." Okay, it's not that hard to get your stuff published on these platforms. They're taking advantage of the naive authors. And what's really scary is the contracts that you sign, you pretty much give up your, co your, your, your rights to the content to them. And you're trusting them that they have good enough reporting, that they're going to give you accurate reports. And that what happens when they go out of business? And the, the relationships that these indirect aggregators have with these con companies is with them. You're not in the picture. And this is really scary because what's happened in the publishing world is traditional authors, a lot of the publishers have gone out of business. And the authors can't even get their own books back. You know, they, it's, it's a sad situation, but when a company goes out of business and they have to pay the bills and the guy can't pay his mortgage, believe me, we do very unnatural, I'm not saying we, they do very unnatural things in order to just survive. So these guys bother me, but in some cases, this is the only path. And I'm going to talk about those. So really, Amazon is the number one. You've got your print books, Kindle books, and Kindle blogs. I'm going to show you how you can actually start selling your blog on Kindle if you weren't aware of that. There's a lot of people doing that. Um, Apple and Droid are the two biggest handheld e-readers, e right? Um, iPad, which of course is the, uh, everybody knows about that. And then Google Books is of course going on the Droid. So you will see a Droid, and Droid is Google's uh, competition to the Apple iPhone, and there'll be a Droid tablet coming out soon. So, you know, Google Books feeds into the Droids, and uh, iTunes feeds into the Apple readers. Then there's other readers like Barnes and Noble's Nook. Borders has one called Kobo, but it's not theirs. They're partnered with another company. And then there's a Sony reader, which I understand is actually selling quite well because um, they have all the mainstream. It is nice. And then these are the other distribution points, which are a little less conventional, and I just wanted to share them with you. So these distribu distribution points, you actually sell as PDFs, meaning they can be read on any computer, as you guys know. ClickBank. The marketplaces for these are ClickBank, Pay.com, and eJunkie. Smashwords, you may have heard of them. Scribd. Um, Lulu Marketplace, they have this new one called WeRead. And then uh, Feedbooks is they only take content for free. You can't sell your stuff on Feedbooks. It's, Everything that's put up there is open source, which is, you have to be careful on some of these because there's one out there called, um, oh, what is it? There's a couple of these publishing uh, infrastructures out there that when you click I accept terms and conditions, you're actually accepting that whatever you put on their site is, is well, it's theirs or there's no copyright at all, meaning anybody can scrape the content, use it word for word, and you can't do anything about it. So you just need to be careful. You need to read the fine print. And of course, they change their terms and conditions. So the fast path to e-publishing, just stepping through what I talked about earlier. You know, you set up a blog. The moment you hit post, you publish online. You create co compelling content, and you can create, you create a compelling cover and banner. Um, 
there's a lot to be said for a site that has a professionally designed banner. It really raises the credibility of you as an author really quickly. Um, offer a free download, create uh, a following, and leverage social media. You know, how are you going to get people? Most people are spending their days on Facebook now, so you really should be on there driving people back to your site. Add your blog to Amazon's Kindle. I'm going to walk through that in a minute. Um, write your, your ebook in um, Microsoft Word. Um, optimize it and upload to Amazon. You don't need to invest in expensive software if you simply want to go to, MS, or go to Amazon's Kindle. That's the greatest thing I think Amazon did is by making it compatible with documents. In fact, they prefer Word documents. Um, however, these other, and kind of the quandary that the publishing industry is in, they've created this standard called EPUB. And in a lot of ways, EPUB is keeping the everyday Joe out of publishing their content. Because EPUB requires a lot more work. It requires more expensive software. Yes? I have a question about um, publishing your book as a Microsoft Word document. Because that gives people the right to change it. No, no. Kindle converts it to theirs. Okay. Do you simply right. upload that type of file and Kindle actually manage it? They can work with that content better than they can a PDF. Um, publish your ebook to Amazon, offer it as a PDF on your site, and then give away free uh, excerpts on various e-publishing e aggregators. When I say that, you know, offer your, I, I, have a free, I have a free book up on Lulu Marketplace simply to drive people back to 50 interviews. So offer up free content in as many of these places as you can. Smashwords and Scribd is great for free content. I'm not so sure I'm comfortable with putting my paid content on those platforms because they're these scary aggregators, which means when you click yes, they pretty much are the channel into um, the iBook store. In fact, we'll go and I'll, I'll get into the iBook store in a second, how you break into that. Fast path, this is a fast path to print publishing. So walking through a simple format um, process if you want to actually get your book printed. And, and what I would encourage you to do is after you've had some success and you feel really proud of your ebook, there's nothing like a printed book to give you credibility and a, a sense of accomplishment and to get you speaking engagements. It's very hard to get speaking engagements saying, well, go check out my ebook or go check out my blog. But when you have an actual book, the world just sees you differently. I don't know why. Um, so you create a professional banner, or sorry, professional cover. This is lesson learned. Don't just try to do it yourself and don't just hire your friend who's a graphic designer. You need somebody who knows how to do cover designs. Um, upload it to something like CreateSpace or other self-publishing service. Um, I'm not out here to try to compete with these services. There's a lot out there. Lulu, I didn't have the best experience with Lulu, personally. Um, CreateSpace, I've heard better things about. That's the one that Amazon owns. The great thing about CreateSpace is your book will get up on Amazon quicker than any other um, print-on-demand company. The painful thing about the printer I use, it takes six to eight weeks to get our book covers on Amazon because Amazon wants you to use them. Um, and explore distribution options. This, uh, you know, another thing about the going with a publisher versus going it alone. This is what's really going to kill you going it alone. Um, a, the largest distributor in the world is Ingram. And there's another one called Baker and Taylor. Now, Baker and Taylor you can get into if you go create space. But Ingram, they don't take anybody's book. You can't just, you have to have uh, four to five titles published before they'll actually consider listing you in their catalog. Um, they also charge a cataloging fee. So this is some of the disadvantages of self-publishing your own book. You work with somebody like myself, a niche publisher, you know, essentially the burden is spread across all these authors. So not one of us is getting hit with the cost of, of doing business with these distributors. And quite honestly, I need to get another 10 or 15 titles before some bigger distributors will actually start to pay attention to us. What you want to be able to do is give them a catalog, and all of a sudden now they're like, okay, I can show this whole catalog to the book buyer, and now I've got something to offer. They're not going to be out there trying to hawk your one book. You're the one that's going to be doing that. And then decide if um, you want to sell it direct or, or not. And what I offer, my, what I do for my, a lot of my authors, in fact, one of the reasons they, they like working with me is that I take the fulfillment off their shoulders. So when somebody orders a book, I'm the one shipping it. And I can tell you, as somebody who had one book, that it's a real pain in the butt when you've got another job and you have to go down to the post office and ship a book. But when you're shipping all these books and one person is doing it, it's a little more worthwhile, right? All right, so getting your blog onto Kindle, I'm going to walk through the nuts and bolts of how you do that. Step one 
is create a WordPress blog. You can actually create a blog on Blogger as well because they have an RSS feed. The thing that um, you need to do with an RSS feed, and I'll have to step back to this. This is one of those topics where if I get bogged down with all the questions, then I won't be able to move forward. So I really apologize if you don't know what I'm talking about. But um, if you go to, uh, it basically a blog has an RSS feed which allows you to syndicate your content. You create a feed burner account because that's what Amazon Kindle, that's what Amazon likes. It's a clean RSS feed. So then you um, <clears throat> start writing some great content. There's really no point in putting your book up on, or your blog up on Kindle until you have something compelling because somebody's actually going to pay for it. So what Amazon offers people who own Kindles is for, I think, 99 cents, you can subscribe to a blog. So you know Amazon doesn't charge you a wireless access fee to use the cellular network. But if you want to get your blog updated, you've got to pay that 99 cent. Um, is it 99 cents a month? It's, yeah, I think it's 99 cents a month for that blog. So that's how they're making their money, is that if you want to have the convenience of your favorite blog on your e-reader, which a lot of people feel there's more value in a blog than there is in a book, which goes back to this whole point of why digital publishing is a smarter way to go. Anyway, that's, that's what they're, they're doing at Amazon. Write great content. Go back to your four up and eight up sheets if you're stuck on content, because a lot of people are like, God, I don't know what I'm going to write about. That's why I went through that exercise early on. Um, polish the look and feel. Um, get a professional looking banner and a professional cover. A professional looking cover. If all you're doing is, is a blog, then you don't need a cover. But when people are perusing through blogs for sale on Amazon, they're looking at banners. So if you have an ugly banner, an ugly baby, nobody's going to look at it. And then set up your account on Amazon. So the way you do that is you just go to this website, kindlepublishing.amazon.com. Or just Google getting your blog on Kindle. But, you know, to be honest with you, Amazon doesn't make this stuff easy to find. There's no link on Amazon's homepage to do this. So that's how you get your blog on Kindle. And I'll show you an example of mine that I put up there. Um, getting your book on Kindle. This is a lot easier than uh, you would think. Start with a well-formatted Word doc. Um, <clears throat> I actually paid somebody to create a template that's tagged correctly for Kindle. And what I mean is it, the, hype, the table of contents is hyperlinked. Um, the headers for the chapters are in the right, are tagged correctly. They have to be tagged by, with HTML code. Um, but you can do this all within Word if you know what you're doing. So I paid somebody to create a template for Kindle that I use to publish my books. Um, but the same thing um, is you, you still come back to, actually, you know what? I did the same thing here, too. Sorry. <laughs> ignore that. Ignore that. Um, okay, so blah, blah, blah. Create a cover. Um, create an account and upload your file. So the site that you want to go to to create an account so you can publish your book to Kindle is ddp.amazon.com. When you upload your book to Kindle, you get to preview what it's going to look like on Kindle. So you want to do that and make sure it looks clean. If your book is all messy, which if you try to upload a PDF, so let me tell you the thing about um, e-book, e-readers you need to understand. If you look through these books, they have, it, it's pretty, they've got labels on the side, there's call outs. There's chapter headers, there's numbers and all that. Um, Don's especially, he's got all sorts of graphics and different things like this. E-readers can't interpret any of anything except the text. Because when you own an e-reader, you have the flexibility to enlarge type or decrease it. And you never know what size screen that e-reader, particular e-reader is, right? So if you have a page break right here, and the e-reader is smaller than this, it's going to look really funky. So basically, books out of the gate that are in print are not um, set up for e-readers. What you have to do is strip all this stuff out. And really, that's why Word is a great um, platform, because it's a simple text-only document for the most part. Um, yes? So the question was, does Kindle have a list of requirements or formatting guidelines? Yes. It's not easy. It took me a long time to figure it out. And I'll show you a site. I'm actually um, offered, offering a service to other publishers. Do, I'm doing Kindle conversions now for them because I've learned how to do it. And I've talked to other publishers who are desperately trying to get all their authors on Kindle because there is a lot of demand for Kindle books. And when an author doesn't have their book on Kindle and they know that there's demand for their book, they're pissed at the publisher. P 
publishers cannot convert the books to Kindle fast enough, so they're looking for people like me to help them with that conversion. It's time consuming. You have to know, you have to play within the structure that Kindle provide, that Amazon provides. So you need to know the tags. Um, it's not impossible to figure out. I figured it out, but it's certainly not something you're going to pick up overnight. Um, consider hiring a professional writer if the formatting is wrong. And he, the reason is, is did you know that, <laughs> and talk about free content. So you can buy any book on Kindle and you have up to seven days to return it. And that happens. People read the book and return them. It's a free library account. So if your book looks like crap, it's going to get returned and you're never going to get paid for it. So that's why the formatting is so crucial. We've, we learned the lesson. I mean, when I just threw up a book because, heck, I want to have my book on Kindle, it wasn't formatted correctly. The margins were all off. Um, they were getting returned left and right. But then when we got one formatted correctly, guess what? The returns stopped coming in. But when you're worried about your content going out there for free, if you're making a decision to post your, your book to Kindle, guess what? You're really giving it away for free for somebody who wants to take advantage of the system. I don't think Amazon has any sort of policing system. If somebody's buying books and returning them and buying books and returning them, I don't think they care, to be honest with you. I, I suppose maybe they flag your account or something after an amount of time, but just to know about that. And then, of course, promote your, your ebook. And you, know, you can do this on your own very cost effectively. Um, that's how you publish your book on Kindle. And more channels, and I'm going to show you guys to show you, I, I don't want to step out of PowerPoint to get into internet, but when I do, to get in the internet, but when I do, I'll show you how some of these things actually look. Um, more channels to sell your book. I shared with you guys some of these less, lesser known channels. So ClickBank, I honestly love these guys. I thought they were a Colorado company, but they're actually based in Boise, but they've got a Colorado presence. Um, they do charge a $49 setup fee, but they give you access to the largest, largest affiliate network in the world, which are all these people who have websites that are trying to make a, a dime off of them. And they'll post a link to your book, and they'll get a much higher percentage on your book than Amazon will ever pay them. Um, however, ClickBank doesn't offer a secure downloadable page, so you sort of need to know a little bit about what you're doing to do this. Um, Pay.com, uh, they do provide a secure download page. This is a competitor to ClickBank not quite as mainstream. They haven't been around as long. I, very user friendly. I think ClickBank's getting better. Um, and again, I do like these guys. Uh, we're using pay.com a little bit. Be warned when you hit this site, while it looks like it's free and only $29, you will be upsold out the wazoo um, stuff. And before you know it, you've spent a couple hundred dollars there because they made you offers you can't refuse. So they get you in at the low price point, but then they get you in the funnel. ClickBank doesn't do that. They, get, they basically just put it out there, and they charge you once. Um, eJunkie, uh, I think, is, you know, who knows how much com money that company's made, but five bucks a month is all they charge. But at five bucks a month, nobody's canceling. Because the thing is, once you set up your book on, on eJunkies, even if you're selling a couple a month, or one a month, <laughs> you can justify the $5 fee. And then Payloads is another one. Um, I don't really like what they do, though, because while it's free to set up an account, they quickly start hitting you with a much higher monthly fee when you start getting over $50 a month. And quite honestly, this can happen in a heartbeat. If what you, do you mean, like selling more than $50? Yeah, if you start selling more than $50 a month worth of ebooks, they, they start charging $50. Or, and it goes up from there, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. So I've been struggling with getting our <laughs> books in the iBook store. OK, it's kind of closed. It's, it's exclusive to the big name publishers. Very frustrating because when the iPad came out, if your book was available on the iPad, you sold a lot of books that day. I have my book is an I, iPad application, and we sell on a good week, I sell up to 30 copies of that application. So I can't imagine how many books we could sell if all of our books were on the iBookstore. The thing about the iBookstore is you know, your book is in a much smaller pond. At Amazon, you're in the biggest ocean when it comes to books. So standing out is extremely difficult. But when you're in a smaller pond like the iBookstore was, I think it's become very crowded very quickly. So I did find this website, this one website. If you have a book already, I haven't done it, but they kind of extort $49 out of you um, just to get your book listed, which isn't really right. Amazon doesn't charge you. Why, why is iTunes charging us? Um, 
The other thing, <laughs> if you buy a Macintosh, the, the souped up latest version of Macintosh, and buy the software, you can publish directly to iBookstore. But it's a significant oh, investment. Sorry. Yeah, Apple is uh, not as, yeah. I know people are very loyal to the brand, but they do some things that's very uh, conniving. Um, Barnes and Noble and Google are both due to release their publishing platform this summer. Um, I was hoping Google was going to announce it before this class, but they still haven't. Both of them are going to allow you to publish directly to those readers. And why wouldn't they, right? They want to sell more readers. Heck, you'll buy a Kindle device just because your book is on Kindle. I think Amazon figures that out. Um, you can get your content on the Nook right now if you publish through Smashwords. So remember when I talked about these aggregators? There's a couple times. So for example, if you want to get your book in the iBook store, you've got to use that book baby aggregate or you know, indirect model. If you want to get your book on the Nook, you've got to use Smashwords, which again is an aggregator. Do any of these uh, deal with graphics better than the Kindle, you know, which doesn't deal with it at all? Yeah, he's asking if any of these deal with graphics better than the Kindle. I think the iPad, without a doubt. If you've ever seen one of those, yeah. brilliant. But it's EPUB. And the challenge with EPUB is a format that <clears throat> is it's very out of reach for most anybody who's created a document on Word. Um, one interesting thing, if you guys want to play around with this site, um, feedbooks.com, when you start writing, it's now it's free. Or keep in mind that what you're doing on feedbooks, everything you do is uncopyrightable. It's free to anybody who wants it. Um, when you publish on feedbooks, it actually publishes an EPUB version. So I mean, there are tools that are coming out, and I bet you in six months from now, EPUB will be a lot more accessible to the average Joe. But right now, EPUB, because things like pictures and the formatting on EPUB is a lot more um, conducive to what you see on a print book versus Kindle's version is, is much simpler. It's not as conducive to, you know, they're making the publishers do the conversion and lose a lot of the, the formatting that a print book gives you. Um, I'm not an ebook reader expert, so I don't know. I can't tell you much about the market yet. Uh, I have cartoons in my, in my Kindle version, and they're in the, I mean, I had it done professionally, but not by a service, but they do graphics. OK. And the new readers are getting better. The new Kindle DX, I think, has a much richer display for pictures. But yeah, you've got to have charts and things, but you've got to have them anchored correctly in the document. Otherwise, they show up in the wrong place. And that was the problem I was having. Um, so I'm going to step back through some of these people that, um, and show you some examples a little slower now that you've seen. The reverse engineer, you know, all the infrastructure behind getting your books published digitally. Um, and again, the fastest path to publishing. These are um, some examples. So the Zen to Done guy I was telling you about, you know, these are his rankings. And I'll tell you, when you're an author, these are high numbers. That means you're showing up in searches. Because the way Amazon ranks uh, works is that the more books you sell, the higher you show up in people's searches. If you're not selling a lot of books, you never show up in people's searches. No matter how relevant the topic is that somebody's searching for, the books that they pop up are the ones that are the best sellers. So, I hate to say it, we could try it, but when you type in uh, property management, our book doesn't show up. You have to dig through many pages before you finally get to Mike's book. The books that show up are all the books that are already selling tons of copies. So Amazon continues to pad the pockets of the people who are already making lots of money on books. It's not so great for people who aren't. Um, this is a very interesting um, <laughs> thing to observe. And, and I, I use the this, this sense emulate to learn. You know, once you start looking at this stuff, you don't quite look at anything the same anymore. So this, if you ever get a chance to look at the Pomodoro technique, it's a time management. Simple, brilliant, you use this little a, a timer that looks like a tomato. And it forces you to focus for 25 minutes on one thing. While the timer's ticking, believe me, it really consciously keeps you focused on what you're doing. But it was created by this guy. Uh, you know what, I lost, I took that slide out, I guess. But the guy who created it is not the guy who's making all the money off of it. So Stefan didn't create it. It was this other guy. And this other guy created this very simple text-only book that talked about it. But he created this amazing graphical, wow, book with all these pictures. And, and he was a marketer. <clears throat> the guy who started this thing was not a marketer. But the guy who started this thing 
he wanted his content out there. And I'm sure that when Stefan approached him, he said, sure, do whatever you want with it. If this gets, if this gets the Pomodoro technique out to a larger audience, I'm all for it. Now, I'm not saying the creator, Francisco, that's the creator. Um, I'm not saying that Francisco isn't benefiting from this because Francisco is now an in-demand speaker and he leads these workshops on the Pomodoro technique. But what I am saying is you don't necessarily have to be the guy who comes up with the idea. If you find something out there that really you think this is the coolest thing, you know, build a relationship with the person because by you helping to raise awareness for that topic or that person's idea, you actually may be giving them a huge gift. You've all heard the story about Julia and Julia, you know, I'm not saying we're all going to become movie stars or, you know, millionaires with screenplays, but she began blogging in 2002. Um, the, the, uh, the guy who, you know, shit my dad says, he now has a series. So he very quickly went from best-selling author to now having his own series. It just amazes me. Um, he is in Hollywood, by the way. That, uh, he, he lives in L.A. So there's certainly something to be said where you live, I'm sure. But um, a friend of mine, David Wood, who's also in my book, he is first and foremost a marketer. One of the best, one of the top probably 20 information marketers out there. Makes a lot of money. His book, and David, I love you, but I've looked at his book. It's fairly mediocre. But he, uh, thanks, yeah, Nina can vouch for that. Well, he just gave it away, like, uh, what, 100,000 of them? Yeah, I as an e-book. Yeah. All he wanted was your email address. Right. Because he knows how to market somebody wants to get your email address. It's that careful what you take for free because you may wind up spending a lot more when it's free than you would have if you just paid the price up front. Um, getting paid for who you are, I think just the fact that his title is a good example that it's, he figured this out. The original title for this book was The Wealthy Gypsy. But The Wealthy Gypsy did not test well. But this book tested well. Um, Twitter power, Joel Com. you guys have probably heard about him. He lives up in Loveland. Uh, he's one of the top 10, probably, information marketers. You know, But the fact is that marketers do much better when they become authors than authors do when they become authors. I hate to say it. What does his under Twitter power with the best say? How to dominate your market. Oh, yes. Okay. How to dominate one your market. One tweet at a time. So there's so much marketing in a book, and, and it's almost more important than anything else. We just talked about giving, um, and actually, let me jump over to a question somebody had. Um, let me talk about these two really quick. So if you can get on one of these mainstream sites, here it is, right here. So New Age Journalist, let me talk about this for a second. I don't think this is the right title for the slide. Traditional media is motivated to find in-house experts. I see evidence of this every day now. They need somebody on the Today Show to speak about. Today it was, um, there was this plus size model and she had a history of anorexia and they just basically cropped her on a picture and make her look really thin and she's all going crazy because she is a believer for the plus size woman. So they had an expert sitting in with her. That expert was a blogger from iVillage. NBC owns iVillage. So who got on the Today Show? It wasn't an author that probably knew a lot, you know, that, that probably deserved a lot more. It was the blogger who works for NBC. Um, About.com is owned by the New York Times. So my friend Stacy hasn't been featured in uh, New York Times yet. She writes their wine.about.com, mainly because the New York Times has a world-renowned wine writer already. But who do you think they're going to go to when they're looking for content? They're going to go to their own sources and they're going to point you back to about.com. So if you want to build yourself as a credible expert, these are excellent ways to go. I can't tell you much about Examiner yet other than they're starting to go up. So this, I pulled this data today and this shows you the number of visits that these sites are getting. So about.com is this one right here. They're getting, you know, 80, this is in, just in the month of May, 87 million visits. Behind them is Examiner with 14 million, and then iVillage is further down that. You know, these guys are coming up quick. This is really interesting what's happening. And a lot of bloggers uh, kind of scoff at examiner.com writers because they're neophytes. <laughs> is that the right word? They're tech, technically phobia. And the biggest, concern, the biggest issue, I guess, is that they're giving away all their, essentially, 
these sites keep the advertising revenue. With the exception of about.com, I'm going to go uh, back to Stacy really quick, my friend Stacy. So she started writing wine.about.com in January of 05. And um, she gets 800,000 800, to a million page views a month. She earns 800 to $2,000 a month. The reason why it fluctuates so much is because it's based on this crazy al algorithm and it's based on a year to year growth. She couldn't figure out, she said, she, you'll have brain damage if you try to understand the true algorithm they use to pay you. But the good news about about.com is they're paying 250 to 650 a month in base salary. So granted, for most people, this is not enough to live off of. But for the stay at home mom, which Stacy is, this is a nice little side income. Um, I won't tell you how much time she puts into this site because I don't want anybody to know, but I will tell you, it's very, very little. Um, it's it's uh, payouts are based on that. She, uh, her blog in particular has a very tight alignment with the Food Channel. So when they, the Food Channel is referring to wine, they throw her stories, they, have, they pay for most of the advertising. Wow. The perks that she gets are incredible. So she gets invited to four to ten um, wine events a year. Full, all expenses paid, you know, they, they, I mean, she's got the dream job. It's, it's for somebody who loves wine. And then, of course, her whole basement is full of more wine than she will ever be able to drink. Because to get a mention on wineabout.com for these winemakers is huge. That's like the Oprah for the wine industry. So she has an incredible per perk. She lives up in Fort Collins, and she's been doing it for five years. We were just talking today, and she kind of is blown away at what's hap you know, how this has happened in five years. Um, keys to success, you know, she, she loves wine, she loves talking about it, and then she spends all of her time backlinking back to her site. This is how she is able to grow her year-to-year -year growth, and she wasn't using Facebook until today I said, Stacy, everybody's on Facebook. You, if you just set up a, a fan page on Facebook, you're going to boost your traffic immediately. I'll put like on your page, you know, she can tell all her friends, so she's hopefully going to start doing that. Um, interesting to note about about.com is they have 853 subdomains. Okay, so there's authors.about.com, there's bloggers.about.com, there's any top 853 topics. In my mind, this is the, these are the future big boys in publishing, the guys that are doing this. Um, anyway, so you can look into doing this, and, and I guess the point is, yes, you're giving up a percentage of your income to the companies, like these three companies. In the case of Examiner, you're giving up a huge chunk. I don't think authors make very much money here at all. Um, iVillage, I, I don't know what their arrangement is with their bloggers, but bottom line is you can get some amazing visibility. And if you're not, if you have a book, you can mention it occasionally, I suppose. Uh, Stacy told me she couldn't put a button for her book. She doesn't have one yet, but she could review it or anyway. And actually, what she probably needs to know is that she probably has some contacts in the New York Times to get her book reviewed more so than anyone else. Um, did you guys see, you know, I, we talked about that one. It's frustrating. Sometimes you got to chump the whole system and innovate. Innovation is key. Um, it just, uh, what does she mean? Uh, the question is, what do I mean by backlink building? Um, it's basically the more links to your inbound links to your site, the higher you rise up in Google searches. Right. Exactly. And she actually does links, she believes this helps her, she does links within her own site. So she links from one post to another post. So it really, the, it, it increases the, it decreases the bounce rate, which is how quickly somebody clicks away from your site. The longer they stay on your site, the more likely they're going to click on one of those ads. So the more backlinks you have in your own articles, linking to other articles that you've written on your same site, to your own site, to your own site keeps them there and keeps, and get, increases advertising revenue, right? My friend Jen, who's also in the book, you know, that's the great thing about this book or the interviews is I got exposed to people in industries that I had no idea even <coughs> existed. So the millionaire mommy next door. So she started on blogger.com, and I wanted to bring this up because there was a question about blogger.com. Her site, and, and she got on to the Montel Williams show. So she immediately rose to the very top of the search rankings, and she's never lost it because she's actually a brilliant writer. I mean, she's got a real talent. This is honestly, this is one of my favorite blogs. If you ever get a chance, look at Jen's blog, MillionaireMommyNextDoor.com. Um, anyway, her site got hacked at blogger.com. Somebody stole her password. Started putting all these ads, 
spam, porn, <laughs> who knows. She was screaming at Google. There's nobody to talk to at Google. I'm sorry, there's no phone number to call. <laughs> this service is free. You're not paying anything, so there's no support. They finally, when they did respond to her, their solution was to shut the site down. They just said, you know what? Your site's been compromised, you were just shutting it down. She couldn't get any access to it. The answer, their answer to the security breach was that the, you're essentially, you're shut down. So for about you know, three months, and she had hundreds of thousands of visitors. I wanted to get an updated number for her, but it's in the tune of you know, half a million visits a month is what she has. And she overnight lost all of them. She has nothing she could do. Oh. So she learned a very valuable lesson. And it, actually, she talks about it on her blog. If you search for this uh, post, you can read the whole story. She eventually got moved over to WordPress.com, her own self-hosted version on her own domain. And migrated over time all of her posts, but this was a very painful learning experience. So as far as blogger.com goes, um, and WordPress.com is kind of the same boat, although I've heard better stories out of WordPress.com is when something does happen, there is a community of people there that want to help you. In the case of blogger.com, you're talking about Google. And you know, there's way too many people asking for help. So. Um, the day she posted, she, she interviewed me because she's in my book. So she interviewed me because she wanted some video on her website. The day she interviewed me was one of the biggest high, uh, traffic day. I think I got like 500 hits on my website that day. So the point is, you know, if you <laughs> build relationships with these bloggers who have large followings, when they mention your site, you can quickly rank up. Now, I think where I blew it, while I got this big hit that day, my site was not optimized to keep the people there. There was no stickiness factor, which is where doing this all well pays off. I mean, you can slap up a lot of junk up there, and you might get a lot of traffic for a moment. But if you want them to come back, you've got to really hone in your craft and think of yourself as a writer, not as just some blogger. And if you look at the quality of um, Jen's post, and I think she spends two to four hours minimum per post. And in fact, she writes it, and then she comes back to it the next day after she's had time to think about it. I mean, that's major commitment to her post. But when she writes something, she wants to make sure it's of the highest caliber. Um, and she writes something about that she's passionate. In fact, she donates all of her money to charity that she makes off of her site. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on time? OK. This is pretty amazing, what Google's doing, when I started to look into all the services that they offer. So. Keep in mind the world according to Google and why you never have to go anywhere else. So to create your content, or, or first, of course, you have to write your content. You can upload your book to Google Books. You can create a site to promote your book on blogger.com, which is a Google site. You can set up Google Analytics so you can actually see who's coming to your site. Now you can actually sell your book through Google because they offer Google Checkout. And now you can sell your ebooks, or you soon will be able to sell your ebooks on Google Editions. So now you can sell your print books and you can sell your ebooks. Guess what? You haven't left Google yet. Now you can promote your book through Google, running AdWords. Uh, you can create opt in newsletters with FeedBurner, which is a Google service to basically, if you want a free um, email service, FeedBurner is it. So you can collect email addresses. Um, you can use calendar, Google Calendar to market your events, create you, videos to drive traffic on YouTube, owned by Google. And then use Google Groups to create your own book groups, to create your own legions of fans. They can do it all on, allow them to communicate with them, each other. You can do it on Google Groups. I mean, this is amazing when you think about the fact that all of it is there for free. There's nothing you have to spend a dime doing it. Now, you know, there's a lot of legwork involved in, in this, um, but Google loves it. You know, they don't want you to go to about.com because they'd rather you run AdWords to drive traffic to your site that you own. That's how they make money. So I think that's the future for, I mean, this, this is a, a future publishing company in a box in, in a lot of ways, right? In the new age. Um, you still need to set up, a, all right, I take it back. You gotta get your books printed somewhere. So when you use Google Checkout, this means you're shipping your own book, so. They don't print books yet. That's one thing Google doesn't do. But keep in mind, if the world is buying ebooks, you're in good shape. So how do you publish your book one tweet at a time? So you, you create a Twitter account um, for your book title. Um, you add a Twitter widget to your um, site, 
What that is is basically it's a running scoreboard of all the posts that you've done so that when you um, write a post on Twitter, it can actually be posted on your blog. And you get the option to basically, this is all done within Twitter. There's, a, there's an option for, um, actually here, why don't we click on this? Uh, I don't know what I was logged into. I'm a little scared about to click on some of this stuff. Um, well, just because I have multiple accounts, I don't know which one. You know, some of them are test accounts. Yeah, we might not want to see some. Of those. <laughs> I'd be happy to share with you guys what I'm, what I, have, my number is, and all that. But um, uh, anyway, you can also create a um, a blog spot. That's blogger.com. So you don't need to do WordPress. And then essentially, what you do is when you write a tweet, when you log into Twitter and you do a tweet, it automatically takes that tweet and it posts it to your blog. Um, I love this tool, Twitter Tools. It's a plugin for WordPress. Alex King is actually a, a person here in Denver. And I think this is a very popular post. So, sorry, you guys, this is a little technical, but. Um, You're going to send us all these. Yeah. Jason, uh, Justin, on the other hand, and I think he's a fairly low tech guy. So, he created an account on something called status.net. Have you seen this yet, Anita? Mm -mm. So, nobody, not many people know about it because pretty much every um, short name I could think of was available. So, you know, if you go to Twitter and your, your name is likely taken, I'm thankful I got Ryan Schwartz. It's a popular name. But if you go to StatusNet right now, it's a new service so, and nobody knows about it. So go ahead and register your name, if nothing else, before somebody else does. It's free. But what StatusNet does is it takes, it basically creates your own Twitter. It, it creates a Twitter stream for you, like your own personal Twitter stream. Now the good news is you can link it to Twitter, so everything you do on Twitter will post to your StatusNet. The cool thing about StatusNet is it looks like a web page. It's a microblog page. And it's limit, you know, limited to how many characters you can do. It's a very simple thing. But this is basic. We're, we'll look at J Justin's site here in a second. Um, and you link the two so that when you post to Twitter, it goes to your status net. So before I get into some of the things, I'm going to just show you guys some examples. An idea without a deadline is just a dream. You guys can talk about these things all day long. But until you do something, it's, it's just a dream. Um, I'm putting links to a lot of these resources this is the, the site I was telling you guys about, kindleexpert.com. And click on the resources tab. And I'll put this, this presentation up there. Because I'd rather you guys visit this because um, as I refine and fix and find new resources, I'm going to be updating them here. If I send you guys something, the moment I've actually hit send, it's probably out of date. So I'd rather just put it up there on a on kind of a live document so you can always see the latest and greatest versions there. Um, I, these are just some tools that I've used over time. Um, you know, I, I guess I a lot of people throw out, hey, you should do this, but then they don't give you any specific methodologies. I'm not going to get into any of these specifically, but um, I use the Merlin principle, the Pomodoro technique. Um, I like the mission control. I went through that training. Actionmethod.com is a really cool site that gives you ways to um, do this. And then 30boxes.com is probably my favorite because it's a very simple calendar that allows you just to put like, you can only see three things a day that you can do. And it forces you to really only do a couple things versus getting completely overwhelmed by this long list of 20 things and then the important things get lost. So the truth is if you've got 20 things to do, you need to put three things a day. And don't fool yourself that you're going to get 20 things done today. I think just exploring new markets, so I just touched on what is known out there today, but there are new markets for your content that are out there. One of them is Daisy. Daisy provides content to the um, blind. Oh, cool. So when your book is Daisy compatible, people who are blind can buy your book. And the people that, the, the technology that speaks a Daisy book is much better than any technology you've ever heard before. And the people who run this are really frustrated that the publishing industry is trying to invent these new technologies when they've been doing this for years. So check out daisy.org. Um, look at what people are doing with Google Books. And um, you know, just come up, you know, look at where, what other markets, potentially avenues you could get your content out there. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different ways you guys can explore this. So let me touch on a couple. Let me show you guys some specific examples. Um, and this is dangerous because I didn't have a lot of these saved. But I'm going to first go to Amazon.com to show you guys how some of this stuff looks. So let's look at um, 
50 interviews. So you can see my paperback book is there, but then here's the Kindle edition right here. So when I click on that, yeah, it's, I'm glad I didn't depend on the internet. This is a challenge when I'm wireless. And I don't know if it's my computer or what, but the uh, speed is way too slow. But I wanted to just show you what some of these listings look like. Um, let's see if I can open a new window and show you what it looks like for a blog when you actually list your blog up. So let me see if I can search. Let me search just all departments. Hmm, it's not showing up, so let me look under Kindle Store. Maybe they took me off. Hang on, because I was using the word Kindle. Um, okay, so here's one. So as, when you search under the Kindle store, it's got my Kindle book, but it's also got my blog that you can buy for $1.99. So this is what it looks like. So the monthly price is $1.99, and you can essentially subscribe to my blog, and it's you know, it gives you a 14-day trial, it looks like. And <laughs> there are tons of blogs out there. You take one like the Portable NBA. I'm sure his is up there. Well, maybe it's not. How many blogs do you have to have done before you have You can do one. Really? Yeah. Um, chances of somebody staying, staying subscribed are pretty slim. Um, this Mike's been doing it longer than anyone else, right here. So his is only ninety nine cents. So I don't know how I set the price, but this is basically what it looks like. So if somebody is on a Kindle, and I don't know, I don't have a Kindle, so I can't tell you what this looks like. But my guess is somehow it's easy to get to browsing what things are available on Kindle. It's probably a lot less um, friendly looking this way. So that's the example of that the sites I was just telling you guys about. Um, publishing. Well, hang on. Let me go back to my talk here and see what else I wanted to cover. Oh, let's look at some of these guys' sites. So let's look at, uh, shit, my dad says. <laughs> All right, so this is a site that's built on that status.net. And these basically are his tweets. Yeah, you can see why this guy's doing that. Yeah. Does Dad know? <laughs> yeah, really. He does now. He didn't for a long time, and when he found out he had all these Twitter followers, he had to go have a conversation, and his dad was like, well, I don't care what the fuck you do, and blah, blah, blah. You know, he did kind of what he expected. <laughs> so, but, you know, this guy, so he basically pulls his all over. So this is his site. There's nothing more to it. And that's, that's all he does, and, and he doesn't even do it that often. Sorry, you guys can look at this anywhere you want. But my point is, even though this content is free, let's go to... Um, so even though this guy gives away his book for free, I want you to see his... Uh, well, see, I'm talking about him. But look at his ranking... <laughs> number nine. His book is number nine in the Kindle store. Wow. So you tell me if giving away your content free doesn't lead to something. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you run by for me, or do you know the different copyright? If I go Google Books, do I own my content? If I do Amazon, I mean, what happens in all of this? Because I have a friend right. who's a, a well, copyright, I don't, I don't and he tells me that it's, if you post yeah. on a comment on a blog, you know, on somebody's blog, whatever you write belongs There's to them. It belongs to Health Post, not me. Yeah. It's kind of scary. Yeah. It, she was just asking about the copyrights out there on the web. Yeah. And I would tell you that most of us are so small that none of that matters. You're when you're Seth Godin, when you're Malcolm Gladwell, when you're Oprah Winfrey, all that stuff might matter, but does it really matter for us? Okay. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I can tell you that I'm not sure what anybody's worrying about. If that's preventing you from doing this, 
then you probably sh aren't going to do it. No, no, that's not what's preventing me. I'm just curious yeah. about the different arrangements that you do of Amazon Kindle, if you do a Google Books, or so, these different things. What, what's your comment? So the, some of the things I have seen out there, which is you should be aware of, which is a little alarming. So I didn't mention this. I should have, because this usually is the real surprise. Right now, and I don't know how much longer this is going to be happening, and the reason I jumped on to KindleExpert.com is because Amazon is paying 70% to the author if you price your book between $2.99 and $9.99. That is phenomenal. Seven, it means on a $10 book, you're getting $7. If you price your book over $9.99, you get 35%. If you price your book less than $2.99, you get 35%. So they're trying to force the publishing industry to sell ebooks at this price point, and they're succeeding. And they're unfortunately driving the price point close to the $2.99 because there's a lot of mediocre books out there. But if you only spend $2.99 on it, chances are you're not going to you're not really going to lose any sleep over it. And you probably won't return it either. Yeah, you probably won't return it. That's why the iStore app. That's why the i i um, iTunes Store is so successful. It frustrates me because my book is like three dollars and ninety-nine cents on the iTunes store, but the moment we raise the price, it stops selling. So, you know, that's unfortunately it's just the way the world is. But if you read the fine print at Amazon, when you upload your book to Kindle, you are committing you're telling them that you promise not to publish your ebook on any other platform. However, Unless you're a big name publisher and a big author, do you think they're really going to care? If you're selling books, do you think they're really going to take your book offline because you're selling it over at Barnes & Noble? I don't <laughs> think so. But the big name authors like, is it Stephen Covey? You know, he's got an exclusive on the Kindle. He can't publish on the Nook. And Kindle loves that. Drives publishers crazy. And that's why there's been sort of this slow, I mean, to be honest with you, I think the adoption of eBooks has been really, stag has been really um, stunted by the crap that's going on by the distributors. But there's so much money in the, in the business right now that, so yes, I mean, there's some things you need to worry about. But again, we are so small that I just would be surprised. Plus, here's what I would tell you. You can always change the title and change the cover and you have a new book. <laughs> so you just publish it under a different name. All right, a couple other examples. I was just gonna show you guys. Um, so when you go to entrepreneurs.fifteenusers.com, just show you how one of our sales pages looks. You know, I have, I don't have a squeeze page like I probably should just to capture. But what I wanted to mention to you is uh, how it sells through ClickBank now. So this is a site you hit, and you'd read all this, you'd read all about the stories, wow, 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 and. At this point, you're like, wow, okay, it's giving free shipping, add to cart. So when I click here, it takes me to ClickBank, which, you know, people look at this and they may do a little research on ClickBank, but here's what was surprising to me. I still have a merchant account at this site here, wisemediagroup.com. Um, I bought this account through a company called Volusion so that I could list all my books here and I could sell them. These are all of our books, you know, our own Amazon. Thought, how cool is this? We get to, you know, we sell direct. We get 100% of everything. Here's what I found out: is people don't know Wise Media Group. They don't know who I am. They really don't trust me because they've never seen my site before. They click Add to Cart and they're about to type in their credit card number and they're like, God, I don't know where this is going. But in the case of ClickBank, they can do a little research and realize that this is a this is a big name uh, company. And they feel actually more secure. It's kind of like why people buy on Amazon, because they feel safe that they're giving their information to this company, which they should be more concerned because Amazon knows everything about you now, <laughs> and they'll sell it to the highest bidder. But um, that's an example of a book on ClickBank. Let me show you uh, how an, a free download looks. So if we go back to there and click on Resources, Just to confirm, you don't have this presentation on KindleExpert.com and our resources. Yeah. Okay. I will. Great. Within 24 hours, before I leave for Iowa, I'm leaving first thing Saturday morning to ride across Iowa. So I mentioned to you the um, 101 resources. So this used to kind of be front and center on my site. So somebody look at this and they're like, "Well, I'm not really ready to buy anything yet, but this looks cool." And so when they click on this, it takes them to eJunkie. 
this is what I pay five dollars a month for. This says cool. There's no cost. Let's go ahead and check out. I got to give my information before it'll give it to me. And this is all set up through eJunkie. I didn't have to do anything. Looks good. Yes. So now it's taking me to this secure download page. And I've got to click here to download it. And when I do, it automatically starts coming to my computer. And this way, I didn't give away content without getting something in return, which is that person's email address. And that's the most important thing I would encourage you to do, even if you're six months to a year out from getting your book published. Because these are the people. Then, of course, you can just open this. And it has that checkbox for sign up for a newsletter. And then the default is you don't sign up for it. So you got the email, but they haven't opted in to yeah. receive. You know, I'm using MailChimp, which doesn't work. So I can take those email addresses and drop them into opt in or drop them into MailChimp. I guess the challenge I'm having with that, Anita, is that the moment you send your first email from MailChimp, AWeber, um, any of the mail services, there's this huge thing at the bottom that says, if you would like to unsubscribe, click here. And if this person has never gotten an email from you before, it seems to me more times than not, they're just like, I don't know what this <laughs> is. They may forget who I was, and they click unsubscribe. So I'd rather just keep the email addresses, and when, because we're still small, and each author has a small list. They can just send a mass email to everybody they know. Yes. Um, I just want to mention Mailchimp is really, 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 really sticky about people. Using that. Yes. If you, I had, I sent out 300. I got four people. One who was a friend um, who clicked spam, and they kicked me off. Ouch. Yeah. It was huge. They call it abuse, right? You know, the, the other um, solution, if you look at, um, let's go back to this one, FeedBurner. Um, these, um, these different stories, and what I tell you is pay close attention. And what I can notice now is even the tools that these guys are using, because now I'm getting familiar to things, um, you know, the different tools that they're using to promote themselves. And David Wood, my friend, he probably did the most picture-perfect book launch I've ever seen. But of course, he's an info marketer and knows how to do that. So when he blasted his 100,000 plus list, he got them to become fans on his Facebook page. They got him to, he got them to follow him on Twitter and he got their email address. And for him, the book simply was, wasn't the point. The book was a means to get more people into his funnel. And it does all come back to that funnel. And even these authors, you look at any author, they are offering far more than the book. I don't care how successful the author is. They've got coaching, they've got speaking, they've got other ways that they're generating income. And you kind of want to keep that perspective from the get-go. Um, the book itself is never going to make you rich. You may have a successful ebook for a short period of time, but I don't think there's any lasting, there's not a lot of topics that are going to be evergreen, meaning well, I, you know, I could be wrong. I mean, it, there could be books out there that continue to sell more and more every year. I hope that some of our books you know, continue to be very strong sellers over the years. I don't know, Robert, if you have any thoughts on that concept of the, the spike in book sales, which typically happen when an author first releases a book. And then what typically does is, OK, everybody you knew and everybody who knew them got your book, sort of, sort of drops, but then you sort of have these occasional pops throughout the life cycle of your book. Like I sold 87 books down in Durango last week. I went to a conference. They bought a book for every attendee. It was great. Well, I just want to show you guys my, uh, the website I set up and the resources tab. So here's KindleExpert.com. And if you click on the resources tab, basically I have links to a lot of these resources. And I'll put a link to the uh, PowerPoint in here as well. Um, and I just continue to, to build on this. Um, this just talks about my services to publishers. Um, interesting thing you guys probably heard about Kindle. Art sales are now outselling hardback books on Amazon. And um, I talk, I walk you guys through step by step how to put your WordPress blog onto Amazon. And then this, I just talk about basically what I told you guys is, in my mind, this is a no-brainer. This in in the history of publishing, there has never been a time when you could publish a book for about $250 and get a return on investment with 50 copies sold. Really, is all you need to do. It, you know how many books it takes for one of my authors to typically break even? Um, it's typically about um, 
three to 400 bucks before you break even on your original investment. And that doesn't mean all the time. Yeah, in print. So th th think three to 400 books to break even on your you know, two to $3,000 investment. Think 50 books, e-books sold, to break even on your $250 investment. So it is, it is, I think, just amazing. Now what this means, of course, is that there's going to be a flood of e-books coming out. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys, it's 8.30. I'll be around for a little bit for questions, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.